It is Thursday, February 23rd, 2018. My name is Ashton Ellen. This is another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining me today is Ambassador nominee to the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, uh, Mr. J. Randy Evans. Mr. Evans is currently a partner at Denton's Law Firm here in Atlanta. He also serves as co-chairman of the Georgia Judicial Nominating Commission, and he is the outgoing Republican National Committeeman from Georgia. He has held a plethora of high offices within the Republican Party of Georgia through the years, and in addition to his professional and political careers, Mr. Evans is a prolific author of books, articles, columns, and invited talks. Last fall, President Donald Trump nominated Mr. Evans to become the next United States Ambassador to Luxembourg. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans, for Thank joining you. me today. Thank you for having me. Really do appreciate it. I was wondering if you could, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about your your, your upbringing, um, your childhood, um, growing up, uh, and how you got involved in politics. Uh, that's a that's a pretty broad question. So I'll, <laughs> I'll start with the beginning. I was born in Dublin, Georgia, which is a little town that's halfway between Macon and Savannah. Um, my grandparents lived in a little small community called Rockledge, which was less than a thousand people. Uh, my parents uh, worked at Robbins Air Force Base, so we lived in Warner Robbins and spent our time going back and forth uh, to Dublin. Uh, literally, I was fortunate in that um, Warner Robbins and Houston County uh, were beneficiaries of having the Air Force Base and uh, you know, having an education system that was really outstanding. We had an outstanding debate program, um, and that's when I got involved in, uh, in, in uh, scholastic debate, uh, where I was the state champion and got a scholarship to West Georgia College in Carrollton, where I, I debated there on a debate scholarship. In my junior year, we were, we were third in the nation at the national debate tournament. Um, and so, you know, I didn't really grow up in the world of politics, mostly because I came from a family that was, you know, pretty poor. Uh, my grandparents really didn't have indoor plumbing until I was up in a few years. Uh, we didn't have, you know, televisions all over the house. But we really, you know, were just pretty poor. And I, I loved to read, and then I became involved in debate, and I loved debate. And it carried me all the way through law school, where I was on the national moot court team, where we were also third in the nation uh, on my third year, and on the national mock trial team, where we were in the top ten. So um, I think where everything changed for me was in 1976, when I attended West Georgia College. I, I took a college course from a professor named Newt Gingrich, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, he doesn't like for me to tell this story, but the truth is that I took the class and after three days concluded that it was a little bit below where I was and dropped the class. But that nonetheless didn't stop me from getting involved in his campaign. He had run in 1974 during the Watergate scandal as a Republican from Georgia and lost against a very powerful incumbent. He had run again in 1976, uh, which is the year I arrived. Uh, and he lost again. Of course, that was the year that uh, President Carter was at the top of the ticket, which was not exactly a great year to be a Republican running from Georgia with President Carter at the top of the ticket. And then he ran again in 1978, and he won. Um, and then the following year, or after he took office, I moved to Washington and lived in the basement of his house where I worked in his office. Um, my father was very adamant that I get my finish, uh, my co my finished college and get my law degree. So I came back um, home uh, after having worked on Newt's uh, winning '78 uh, campaign and having worked in getting a little taste of Washington D.C. Uh, while I was there. I uh, got graduated from uh, West Georgia College. Uh, then I attended uh, the University of Georgia during what I refer to as the Herschel years. Uh, 1980 to 80, 80 to 83, uh, and uh, when I graduated, I originally moved to Cobb County, um, and I got a call from Newt, and he said, "Where are you? Where are you going to live?" Because I was looking for a house at the time, 
And I said, uh, well, we're looking. And he said, well, you know, one of the counties that's most important to me is Douglas County in my congressional district. That would be a great place. It's closer to, you know, your wife's parents. Uh, and, you know, uh, it needs organizing. It's, it's, it's a Republican county that doesn't know it's Republican. And so I moved to uh, Douglas County and became the chairman of the Douglas County Republican Party, like right away, it was <laughs> like uh, months. Uh, and we then in Douglas County elected our first Republican school superintendent and our first Republican county commissioner. I mean, we, we did we did well. Um, and so I then uh, ran for and was elected as the sixth district chairman following uh, John Stuckey. And um, and that would have been uh, 86, I believe. Hmm. And then, and I, so in 86, uh, I'm the district chairman, which means that I'm working very close with Newt's congressional campaign because they're the district campaign. Um, and we, we won, I forget, there, there were numerous news articles I think we won close to a hundred seats uh, in that cycle, um, and uh, what Newt then wanted was for me to help take this recipe for uh, for organizing and recruiting candidates throughout an entire congressional district and replicate it for a model that we would use to capture a majority in the Congress. So tell me how. You went about in the 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, the, building the Republican Party in, in Douglas County and, and in West Georgia. Well, really, I think the biggest thing was to do was to identify folks uh, who were willing to work and be a part of an organization. You know, it wasn't exactly at that time uh, politically correct to be a Republican in Georgia. I mean, there were virtually no Republicans in Georgia. We had. You know, Mac Mattingly had gotten elected and then promptly lost after his first term. Newt was the only sustainable uh, Republican. He had been in Congress, you know, uh, since 78. You know, if you know, I've, I've now taken time off to finish my college career, law career, so a fair amount of time has passed. And what, what concerned him was the party as district-wide you know, to start with the fundamentals, which is to, to, to free him up to be able to go to other congressional districts around the country and build bridges and bring together a coalition of like-minded Republicans. In order to do that, he needed a solid platform. And so what, what started as, I need you to fix or help fix or help organize this one county party, which should be one of our most vibrant and strong political parties in the state uh, is largely, you know, dysfunctional. I think I went to my first uh, party meeting and there were three people. Mm. Uh, and yet you've got this county that is, at that time, you know, it, it was a lot like, uh, you know, uh, Cobb County, you know, it was a lot like North Fulton, a lot like North DeKalb, and yet it had no party infrastructure. And the net effect of that is, is that contrary to popular belief, uh, party infrastructure in the 80s and 90s was enormously important. The ability to touch voters and get them to actually go vote was the difference. It also meant the difference between having a bench and not having a bench. You know, when I first started in, uh, you know, I think it was 84 or 85, uh, you know, in Douglas County, there were no locally elected Republicans. And so the net effect was when Newt showed up, it, he, he couldn't stand with a county commissioner or a sheriff or a superintendent. Right. He has, and there was nobody then uh, to draw upon to run for these offices because there was no bench at the school board level uh, or at the, you know, whatever level, state representative level. And so part of, part of the strategy was, you know, tell people they can make a difference and point out what the differences are, but also, you know, make sure they understand why it's so important that they personally uh, run for state representative. Whether you're a Delta airline pilot living in, uh, you know, the Oakwood subdivision, or whether you were somebody else, 
that you that you actually say I'm going I, I I'm going to run I'm going to run against a incumbent Democrat who's probably been there a decade, and I'm going to try to become for elected. And we we succeeded with uh, Jim Steele, who was state super or the first African American uh, uh, Republican school superintendent, with uh, Steve Ferris, who was the first Republican county commissioner uh, for Douglas County. Now these were all and. This was this happened in a period of two years, and so everybody's like, "Well, I guess it can be done." And Georgia was fertile territory for Republicans, and so what Newt then wanted to do was to take the petri dish of what had happened in Douglas, add it to what he was developing at GoPack, mm -hmm. um, and then say, "Let's see if we can do that on a district-wide level," which we then promptly did. Uh, literally in the following cycle. As I said, I probably could dig out. I mean, I think we elected 103 Republicans across the 6th Congressional District in the following cycle, and it just blew everybody's head up because it's like, you know, we're winning in places like Coweta County and, you know, uh, Carroll County and other places that nobody expected that you would be picking up, you know, and we weren't greedy. We weren't trying to win you know, everything. We just wanted to get a foothold in. But the moment you got one locally elected Republican official, you could then build a structure around both their campaign as well as Newt's campaign, as well as every other cycle, the presidential campaign, because we really weren't competitive in the governor's races at that point. Right. And so we had to rely on, you know, what would happen every fourth year where we could really, you know, hammer it home at a national level. And, and so you would take that into account in terms of building the surge. How, would you, how did you go about convincing folks like, uh, like a skin edge mm -hmm. who ran in 1986 for, for state senate out of Coweta County against an Arthur Bolton who had been attorney general? Mm -hmm. How do you convince a, a young, upwardly mobile professional that the Republican Party of Georgia uh, is the place for them in a state that had been dominated for decades right. and decades by, by the Democratic Party. Well, a large part of it was you had eager candidates. The real challenge was to get them to run as a Republican. Um, I mean, lest we forget that Sonny Perdue didn't start out as a Republican. Nathan Deal. Came, Nathan Deal, same way, didn't start out as a Republican. Uh, and so I, many of these folks, whether whether it was Skin Edge or Lynn Westmoreland or, you know, you could take your pick, they had a choice to make. And what I had to do was convince them that if they ran as a Republican, we would give them the resources, the structure, the foundation to win. And so rather than fight their way through a competitive primary, only to then face one of my candidates or one of our candidates in the in the general election, having been battered and bruised through, because the Democratic primaries at the time were just wars. I mean, they were. I mean, you you just didn't come out of the primary without terrible scars because you you've been in power so long. But suddenly you're coming out and you're 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 facing a fresh face who's come through without a primary, who's got resources who's got the congressman backing them, who's now got some county commissioners or sheriffs or DAs backing them. And suddenly they started deciding that rather than go the, 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 the long route, which is go through the Democratic primary, they were going to go through, go straight to the general, and they were going to go straight to the general and know that when they got there, you know, they were going to have a U.S. senator or uh, the, the congressman or whoever to help, help them win. One of the people, you, you've mentioned Newt Gingrich, Speaker Gingrich, numerous times. One of the other people who, who was critical in the Republican Party during this time, Paul Coverdell. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me your experiences with Paul Coverdell and, and your, your assessment of how important he was to building a, a modern Republican Party organization? Well, well, well Paul, was, Paul, Paul had the foundation. It, it, it's not as if Georgia never had Republicans. But what we had were um, a concentration of Republicans in affluent areas surrounding Atlanta. 
and they were uh, a pretty solid minority. Uh, they they kind of thought like a minority, and but they but nonetheless they were important. They were important because when you had Republican presidents, which we had a lot of during that time period, right. they they handed out patronage, and then second. Uh, you you had the they could raise money because they had affluent constituents. Now you have to contrast that with, you know, the Newt Republicans. Now the Newt Republicans are rural areas. These are farmers and small business owners. They're they're not you know I mean, anybody who thinks Lagrange or Heard County or you know pick you know pick any of his old congressional district uh, has that much in common with North DeKalb. Uh, need you know in that time period just needs to go back and look they had they had a very different set of of structures but they but they both fell within the value structures of the republican tent mm -hmm. and so the net effect was uh, we could then lean on them for the foundation and the resources to grow and they could take comfort in knowing that we were starting to take the red and paint other parts of Georgia red. Uh, I think without Paul, there would not have been a a Republican Georgia built by Newt, and without Newt, there wouldn't have been a Republican Georgia built by Paul. I think it was the combination of of a of a college professor willing to go to every town hall meeting, insisted on debating in every single one of the I forget how many counties. I think it was between ten and fifteen counties. And the old six, uh, it took that combined with the stall work here in Atlanta, saying, you know, we're not going to shy away from you, uh, and you know, it, it led to a, a few culture clashes along the way, uh, but the net effect was a steady building. How hard was it to raise money in a state that that? The Democratic establishment, the the law firms, the banks, the the, the Fortune 500s, by by force of habit, um, had supported Democratic governors, senators on down the line. How how did you how did the Republican Party go about trying to build a a, a significant fundraising base, either through the Republican Foundation or or for for candidate specific campaign specific right. fundraising? Well, I think that I think the state party, uh, you know, took that as their large responsibility. Jay Morgan was our executive director, and Jay did a great job. I mean, he really did. I mean, he, you know, he really did reach out and basically say, especially in presidential cycles, I'm not asking for a lot of money here. I'm asking for a thousand dollars. I'm not. I'm not asking for twenty five. Although he did ask for twenty five, and he did ask for big money from some very solid Republicans. And then we then tried to marry that up with Newt's very grassroots strategy, Matt, which was to have barbecues at $25, you know, sell, selling a barbecue, uh, you know, where we, we'd clear, you know, five or $10 per plate. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, in a small county, you're not gonna be doing television. So a little bit of money went a long way. Um, the problem with that that structure was it didn't permit you to compete statewide. So to compete statewide, you did have to have serious, you know, uh, war chest. And until you had a core constituency, um, you just you 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 really weren't going to be able to to compete unless you had, you know, the senatorial committee coming in on behalf of Mac Mattingly and just you know, funneling money in uh, as they were allowed to do where, that, where they largely funded it. But if you expected the Georgia Republican Party to fund, you know, a, a, a competitive race against the Tommy Irvin, the Department of Agriculture, you know, good luck. Tommy knew everybody. <laughs> everybody knew him. They all liked him. Right. And so, you know, it was just a challenge, but it, but it was just the steady drumbeat, really. You mentioned that the, the the sort of the demographics of the old sixth district, um, some sort of exurban subdivision right. communities, uh, like you said, in, that you would see in the inner suburbs of Atlanta, but lots of farmland, lots of rural area. Mm -hmm. 
those rural whites had been the backbone of the Democratic Party of Georgia. Right. How did you go about you, the party, Republican candidates, convincing these voters who had pulled that Republic or uh, Democratic lever for so long that the Georgia Democratic Party was no longer necessarily the vehicle for conservatives? Well, yeah, in fairness, I think the 1976 Democratic National Convention went a long way. I think suddenly, you know, the Democratic Party, which most uh, Georgians knew, was not the Democratic Party that they were watching on television. And whether it was the riots or whether it was the message or whether it was the platform, all they knew was that's not who they are. And so between 76 and then the benefit of having Reagan in 80 was that, that the average Georgia, Georgia voter started to feel at least on a national level and more and more on a local level, that's not who we are. And so, you know, I, you know I, the key for us was you can, you know, you can have the, the best sunshine and the best rain in the world, but if you don't plant the seeds, you're not going to have a crop. So the new model was to get as many candidates to run, as many uh, activists or volunteers to volunteer, uh, and to have a structure to mobilize them. This is before we have, you know, iPhones and air, you know, instant <laughs> communication. So it was literally picking up your ro your rotary phone or your punch phone and, you know, having calling everybody to tell them where to put road signs or where to put mailers or where to hang on doors or where to knock on doors. You'd have all of that so that when the sunshine of a Ronald Reagan came along, which is great weather or a Republican in Georgia, and you've got simultaneously, at that time, a Democratic Party that was struggling uh, internally uh, to find its own, you know, its own definition, its own image. Uh, you know, it, it all came together, you know, to, to create a, a great opportunity in 78 and then in 80. Why do you think, you mentioned earlier the importance of party organization, and maybe this is jumping uh, ahead a little bit, do the parties matter anymore? You, you were a Republican National Committeeman, uh, all these different positions in the party. There's contention now that because we have uh, Post Citizens United, mm -hmm. Facebook, uh, social networking, that the, the institution of the party, the party organization, the party apparatus, doesn't mean as much anymore. Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is we're a two-party system. So... <laughs> built into our structure itself is the importance of the two major political parties. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is the major political parties dictate how candidates win a nomination, uh, whether it's the president or whether it's uh, the local school council, you know, uh, or school board. Uh, the parties uh, set the platform. What we're seeing, which, which I've, I've written about several times uh, and Newt's written about several times, is that we, these political parties go through transformative times. Uh, the best example would have been 1964, most recent mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. would have been 1964 when, when uh, Lyndon Johnson took up uh, the banner of civil rights, appropriately so. And he fought and he won and he was reelected in one of the most significant moments which many historians write about is that Hubert Humphrey uh, his vice president comes out to congratulate him on the, at the ranch in Texas and say, congratulations, we've been reelected. And Johnson's response was to look at him in the eye and to say, what are you smiling about? We have just lost the South for the rest of my lifetime. That's a realignment. What we're currently seeing, and it started with Newt uh, in 2012. He's, he was probably a cycle early uh, and then completed in, with the election of President Trump is a transformation of the parties. They're now taking on new definitional roles because, um, you know, the best way to look at it would be to compare, you know, the two major political parties in the 1880s and the 1890s with the Republican Party and the Democratic Party 
in you know in the the elections right after 1900 when Teddy Roosevelt runs as a third party candidate you literally have a major transformation of the parties and what they stood for but appropriately so we were going from horse drawn wagons to automobiles we were going from candles to incandescent light bulbs right here we went from uh, you know, uh, rotary phones and, uh, you know, televisions where you had an antenna to mobile phones and channels via cable with thousands of channels. And so as technology changes to make connectivity easier, you're going to have voters realign among different interests that are now important. It's, it's no longer important it was no longer important in the 1900s to regulate the width and the length of a candle wick. <laughs> and if that was a major point of the platform of your party, uh, then in 1904, 1908, you know, you pick the year, it, you, were, you were just out of touch because you had to be dealing with the issues of the day. That's what we're dealing with now, which is we're dealing with a whole new set of issues that are the product of, of technology bringing us to places we never expected to be. It does change how we organize parties in an enormous way. Yeah, because we, now, I mean, it used to be we'd carry around a clipboard, we'd have names and addresses, and we'd have which ballot you picked in the last election. All of that's now in an app on your iPhone or on your Droid. And so organization is much faster, more efficient, and easier than it's ever been before because you can communicate. It also permits selective communication which is so, for example, in the last election, you know, uh, the RNC, we developed an enormous data program. And the way in which we got people to the polls was if we knew they hated uh, candidate Trump, but they really believed in the Second Amendment, then they would, be, they would get a series of Facebooks from all of their friends who also believed in the Second Amendment saying, please go vote. And if you believe in the Second Amendment, go vote Republican. But if it, they were folks who really loved Trump, but they really weren't that big on, you know, uh, the right to bear arms, then they'd get a message that says, it's time for the establishment to go. Enough of D.C. Drain the swamp. Go vote for somebody who's never held office before and who's a pro proven businessman. And so they all got a message saying, go. that ability to segregate message is enormous because what we discovered, you know, between 2000 and 2010, what we discovered is there are voters who have a single issue that trumps every right. other issue. Right. So they could agree with a candidate, uh, you know, uh, gay marriage is a great example. You could, you could have a candidate that you agreed with on every single issue, except they were opposed to gay marriage. Well, no matter, no matter how much you agreed with the candidate on every other issue, it didn't matter because that was your most important issue. And that became the issue that dictated how you, how you uh, voted. And the same was true with regard to the Second Amendment. The same was true earlier in the 80s and 90s with regard to abortion. Right. It's just what, what changed was the ability to do selective messaging so that you could communicate only on that message and touch only that motivation. Well, that's a good segue back to the 1980s and, and you brought it up with abortion and those social issues and, and the, the sort of the influx of social conservatives, religious conservatives, the, the religious right, right, so to speak, uh, into the Republican Party in 1988. It seemed to surprise the Republican Party leaders establishment um, that Pat Robertson's supporters, Pat Robertson running for president that year, were so organized, so committed, mm -hmm. and, and willing to participate in the, 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 the precinct county uh, conventions, even when their candidate got 15, 16 percent mm -hmm. of, the, of the primary vote that February in 88. What's your take on, on 1988 specifically with that, that initial influx and then the effect of social conservatives, social conservatism uh, in the Republican Party in the late 80s and 90s? Well, what you had was you had a detached group of, uh, of uh, motivated voters. 
So what had happened was these are were typically the prototype Southern Democrat, Southern white Democrat, typical prototype. Went to church every Sunday, uh, you know, had strong family values, believed in a hard works pay, didn't really believe in welfare as a way to, to carry people along. And so then we have television suddenly in everybody's home in multiple levels, and they see in 1976 uh, and in, even in 72, notwithstanding Watergate in 74, uh, but but they really it really got driven home in '76, which Reagan then capitalized on in '80, which is that's not your party. The Democratic Party's not if if they, if you're in that group that that's not who you are. That's not and they're not who you are, and so you have this detached group and they're looking for a place to go. Now they've already decided they can't stay with the Democratic Party because it was pro-abortion, it was anti-gun, it was all, you know, everything they didn't believe in. Mm -hmm. So in a two-party system, there's only one other place to go, and that's the other party. And there's only one option. You're not going to take over the Democratic Party. It's already gone. Your best shot is to take over the Republican Party. And so that's why we saw extremely aggressive, you know, uh, you know, uh, effort in the early 80s uh, by, by social conservatives to, to, if not take over, at least heavily, heavily influence uh, the Republican Party, you know, especially in the South. And, and candidates were more than willing to, willing to accommodate because here you've got this motivated political base looking for a place to go and you're trying to win in a traditionally democratic state. Did you attend the, the Republican State Convention down in Albany? I did. I did. What, what, was your, what was your initial takeaway? And then looking ahead, what, how do you reunite a party or, or so, sort of regroup, maybe a better mm. word, a, after the contentious uh, fight down, down in southwest Georgia? Well, as you probably know, I, I've chaired more state conventions than any chairman in, in, in Georgia Republican history. And we always have competitive uh, groups. Albany was no different. I have a very, I had, as a chairman, I had a very different style, which was always just inclusion. How do you <laughs> absorb the group? Mm -hmm. um, at the time, though, because suddenly, uh, you know, Georgia had, you know, uh, you know, we had back-to-back -back Republican presidents. There were plenty of uh, patronage and spoils, and those who had had them in the past didn't want to share them with the new. Anybody new, and the ones in the new just wanted to be a member of the, you know, wanted to be under the tent. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I I was kind of, you know, for many of my colleagues, ADA was you know, a, a stake in the ground to defend the integrity of the party, much like in 76, Southern Democrats tried to put a stake in the ground to defend the integrity of the Democratic Party. Uh, those, kind of, those kind of stakes in the ground rarely work. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, they set you back uh, in terms of your ability to build, you know, a, a coalition capable of governing and, and, of, and of winning general elections. So I, w I was disappointed. I, and, and I was one of those who was more than willing to give up my, my delegate slot to somebody else because I knew that the, the, the purpose of being involved was far greater than the accoutrements uh, of, of being involved. Um, so it was a major disappointment, you know, and, uh, you know, it... it, it uh, I think I think it hurt it hurt us here, you know, as far as what we were doing. Now, fortunately, you know, at that time in the sixth, you know, we're all on the same team. I mean, we're we're largely, you know, I mean, I ran for re-election uh, as district chairman, and I had an I had, I think I had an opponent, and I think I got ninety eight percent of the vote. So, even though we had this massive influx in the same year. Um, you know, it didn't. It didn't have an impact where you where you were literally saying, "Okay, great." You know, find a, you know, 
don't run against each other. There are plenty of open seats. Let's let's find a place for you to run. The Republican Party in the in the nineteen nineties that that's such an important decade in terms of electing congressmen, becoming competitive statewide. Why do you think it was the 1990s? As you, you've talked about, you know, sort of building the party in the 1980s. Uh, well, because of Tom Murphy, the Speaker of the Georgia Legislature, decided that he was going to destroy, make sure that Newt Gingrich wasn't his congressman, and he blew up the 6th District. Now, what, what happened was Newt then was, moved to a very reliable, safe district at Cobb, largely East Cobb County, but we had built this base in the old sixth. Well, they took the old sixth and put it into like three or four different congressional races. Mm. And then we were able to take that base and elect a Republican congressman. So, uh, uh, I mean, candidly, oddly enough, the, 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 the biggest pro, uh, janitor of, uh, of, of the uh, increase in the congressional delegation was a Democrat, and it was the speaker... <laughs> blowing up Gingrich's district so that, you know, a Matt Collins could win in Columbus. And why? Because Newt had had Columbus. We had built a very strong Republican Party in that whole area, and Matt Collins had a base from which to run. Or Bob Barr could run in Bartow County and could run in, uh, in Polk County, uh, Cedartown, run in all, Paulding County, run in all those counties. Why? Because it had been in the old 6th, and we had a we had a platform from which that could then be expanded around to the to the rest. And so the net effect was we kept Newt, and then we picked up you know other congressional seats that were largely the old sixth district. Um, and you know that 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 really changed. In my opinion, that reapportionment was the biggest uh, example of something blowing up in your face which is the speaker at that time was committed that Newt Gingrich would not be his congressman. Right. Well, Newt Gingrich wasn't his congressman, but he still ended up with a Republican congressman. Too clever by half. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned GOPAC earlier. I wonder if you could explain, for, for folks who don't know what GOPAC was, um, explain what it was, the mechanisms, and... and what you think the, the, the outcome, the product uh, of, of the sort of the huh. Newt Gingrich, Bo Calloway, the GOPAC um, experience here in Georgia and elsewhere? Well, I think it was, I mean, but legally it was a political action committee. Right. I mean, I mean, it, bottom line was, I mean, it was a political action committee. They, the, it had three effects um, that served to create a platform for for building toward, you know, uh, the nineteen the ninety four revolution, and to be candid, I mean it really did. One impact it had was Newt on cassette tapes, something that most <laughs> viewers probably have no idea what the cassette tape was. Um, articulated a vision of a new America that was built on entrepreneurial ideas, the idea, the concept of a meritocracy that was, was blind to race and gender and ethnicity and based on how hard you worked and how, you know, how committed you were and what your skills were uh, and how, where the flaws were and how the system had become such a product of cronyism. So the first thing it did was it, it precipitated the creation of a vision. And the second thing it did was it, it afforded the opportunity for an entire generation of voters to get a glimpse of that vision. And the third was it created the mechanics, the logistics, for getting the vision to the voters. So you had to have all three. I mean, if you didn't, if you, if you, if we could have produced all the go pack tapes in the world, but if none of it was anything that anybody could identify with or believed or shared, nobody would listen to the tape. Uh, you could, you could have the best vision in the world, 
But if it was a tree falling in a forest and no one is there to hear it, it has no impact. It was, and if it was a non-receptive message, then they would hear it and reject it. So you had to have all three. And that's what GOPAC did. GOPAC brought all three together. And even today, uh, you know, when I talk to people or meet people, they'll talk about the GOPAC tapes. I remember listening to the GOPAC tapes. I remember, I remember hearing about cro the cronyism, the corruption. I remember hearing about how the system uh, perpetuates itself and how we need to take the system back. And that's, that's how you lead a revolution. That's how you, that's how you here in Georgia take, uh, my, my, the best example is you take a, a, a Buddy Darden, who was a congressman, who everybody loved. Buddy went to every funeral, every wedding. He never missed a graduation. Probably he still does. Yeah. I mean, he is one of the most popular people that I have ever met in my life. And he loses to a candidate who most people consider to be a curmudgeon, Bob Barr. Uh, Stiff-lipped, stern, prosecutor, uh, you know, no, no warm and fuzzies. Uh, so how, this is politics. Well, what happened was in that year is people concluded that the party mattered. And it mattered more than the individual. So even though I like Buddy better, I don't like what the Democrats are selling. And I believe in the contract with America. And so I'm going to vote for the contract. I'm not, vote, I'm not voting for or against Buddy. I'm not voting for or against Bob Barr. I'm voting for the contract. And so we ended up, you know, 50 plus seats for the first time, you know, in decades in, you know, recapturing control of the Congress. What did it mean for Georgia to have the Speaker of the House? Well, clout. I mean, you know, the, I, the list of the things that Newt did, which no one has ever chronicled for Georgia, is just enormous. I mean, the Chattahoochee National Park. I mean, there, you know, there, you can go down a long list. Uh, protecting, you know, all of our military bases. I mean, he he was a speaker. Uh, you know, the idea you're going to walk in and shut down, <laughs> you know, Robbins Air Force Base, it, it just wasn't going to make it past the house. Uh, and so uh, he he had he had just even in that. I mean, he you know he was he was not speaker that long, uh, two two terms. Uh, but even in that short amount of time, and the degree to which he elevated the other members in the delegation. I mean, every member of the delegation was getting a subcommittee chair or a chair or uh, being involved in a study group or, you know, I mean, they were, everybody, been, all boats rose when, when Newt Gingrich was the speaker from Georgia. How, you know, you talked about earlier about competing statewide. How, how did the Republican Party go from 1980s where, 1986 where the Republican Party is like, we're not going to contest Joe Frank Harris, mm -hmm. but Guy Davis hops in at the last second, uh, to Johnny Isaacson running mm -hmm. probably the most competitive gubernatorial campaign for the Republicans in a long time, Paul Coverdell winning mm -hmm. in 1992, Guy Milner would have been governor had mm -hmm. Zell Miller not mm -hmm. been, an, been the incumbent. What... What led to that, 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 that growth statewide, that ability to contest the seats in Georgia? Candidly, it was you know, <coughs> a collision course between, you know, what, you know it's, it's funny that now today people think of Newt as being part of the Coverdale group. Having been there, he really wasn't. I mean, I mean it, was, it was coexistence. Uh, each had completely different constituencies. The, the difference was that, that the Coverdale constituency was never going to get any bigger. It might get a little bigger as the population growth in some of the suburban counties, but it was never going to explode. The only way you could explode the way, you know, uh, Republicans did in 94 to recapture control of the Congress was you had to have, you had to have a new Gingrich. And eventually what happened was that there became more of us than there were of them. And so eventually, 
you know, uh, the idea that you could have ever, you know, elected a Ralph Reed as the chairman of the Republican Party in 1992 or 94 is just beyond, uh, after the 88 fiasco, <laughs> is just beyond comprehension. I mean, it's just, it just wouldn't have happened. But what did happen was that when you win, it's contagious, and it, and it carries with it enormous benefits. And the net effect was is that uh, as, as Newt began to win, not only here but around the country, and elect Republicans everywhere from, you know, from, you know, all of the southern states were, were, were flipping at a, at a much more rapid rate even than we were. Uh, and we're winning in other places. It's hard, it's hard then to ignore it. And so eventually then we started to see, you know, we had a little bit of a, of, of a dip, but eventually you started to see a coming together where they didn't coexist anymore. They actually started to be one. And I remember those meetings with, uh, with Paul and with Newt and with uh, many others uh, where the planning started to be an integrated plan of how do we, how do we win statewide. It's, it's unacceptable that we can win in all of these places. We have all these locally elected officials right. and we're not competitive on the statewide level. And I think that then started you know, with Johnny running and with Guy Milner running and, you know, continuing on. But what, to me, what flipped the switch was when Ralph Reed took over as the state chairman, which was a reflection that you then had a united front. You had the social conservatives that had been, you know, in their mind, booted from the convention hall in 88. You had the Gingrich Republicans who had this vision of a federal government and a state government that could actually deliver on promises. You had the traditional uh, country club Republicans who, who had large checkbooks, and they all came together. And that, that made the difference. I mean, if you had said to me that rather than a Johnny Isaacson or a Guy Milner, it would be a Sonny Perdue that was going to be the first Republican governor, I, I, back then, I would have thought you were crazy, but it, that's the, you know, that, that's the nature of, of politics, which is it's always the unexpected. Nobody expected Barack Obama to beat Hillary Clinton and then win the general. I remember Republicans saying, oh, I hope, I hope it's Obama because it'll be an easier win, and me thinking exactly the opposite. And I remember last year, many, many of my Democratic colleagues wishing that it was going to be Donald Trump because they thought it would not only be a cakewalk, but it'd be a wave election. Um, it's, the nature, it's the nature of politics. But it took, a, it took a Ralph Reed with a middle Georgia, former Democrat, converted Republican state senator against probably one of the most powerful governors we have ever had, Roy Barnes. And yet it was that coalition of Republicans that won. And so that, that's why, you know, when you study, if you're a political scientist and you study this, it's always fascinating because everybody looks at the top line. I never look at the top line. Every, everybody gives me the credit because I've, I've been on the winning team a lot of a lot of times. I was on Nathan Deal's winning team and on Donald Trump's winning team and on Newt Gingrich's winning team. None of which anybody gave any hope. Many many others, and it's because I never look at the top line. I look at I look at okay, where's the party infrastructure? Where are the party activists? Are they connected? Are they unified? How do you bring them together? Are they now ready to take and control and govern. You came on board as party council when, when Ralph became chair? Yeah, I, yeah. when Ralph became ch chair, I was he named me the general council and he named me to the state election board, which, to be <coughs> honest, you, you know, I'm not going to tell uh, the parties how to do their business because I, I, it's not my business, but I will say that both parties would be well advised to have the general council be the party appointee because it just eliminates the gap time, 
between what's happening at the state election board and what you need to know in implementing your game plan. Were you involved in the redistricting? Uh, no. no. So, how, other than protect, trying to protect, no. Right. But yeah. So, so how did you approach general counsel? Like you were ta you were talking about what what were the 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 developments, the changes that were being implemented in in terms of voting uh, elections that the Republicans needed to grapple with. Well, I think at, at the, the biggest, turn of the, the, the biggest one was just voter integrity. I met, so I chaired. Um, the 90 campaign, I think it was, uh, let me think about this, 86, 88. Yeah, I think I chaired the 90 campaign. It was the last time Newt ran in the old district. Was that against Worley? I did against David, David Worley. Worley. And I knew full, this was when, so to back up, in 88, uh, Bush 41 is elected. Bush 41 picks uh, Dick Cheney to be vice president. Uh, uh, not Dick Cheney, he picks him to be Secretary of Defense. And he is then, um, he is, so it creates a vacancy in the, the whip position in the right, U.S. House. Right. Newt then runs for the whip position. And uh, notwithstanding whip counts going into the uh, caucus meeting to, to um, elect the whip, uh, <laughs> All the whip camps going in showed us losing by one. They go into the whip meeting, Newt wins by one. So he comes out. He then immediately has got to run for re-election as whip in a race that he just won by one vote. So the net effect is he's not coming to the district. I'm the campaign chair, and so my job is to get him re-elected without him coming to the district except for, I think, the last three days of the sure. of the election. And and Dave Worley was our opponent, he, uh, somebody that I was on the election board with, somebody who I like and respect, have, uh, you know. Uh, but he was the opposition, and the Democrats knew Newt was vulnerable because they knew it was a, you know, it was, a, it was, it was not a gerrymandered seat. It was heavily uh, for Newt. They had limos right around the district with Newt signs in them because Newt, as the whip, <laughs> had a driver. <laughs> uh, and so it was very clever. Uh, but I knew it was going to be a nail-biter of a race. And I knew that as a nail-biter of a race, and this is all documented in, in uh, Mel Steely's book, The Gentleman from Georgia, and it's documented in a couple of other books. So I know that at the end of the day, they're going to steal this race if, I, if I'm not careful. And I knew that there were precincts like the Tallapoosa precinct that if I wasn't careful, there'd be more votes cast than there were registered voters. So we go into the night and Newt's trailing the whole night. And we finally get to about 11 o'clock and one of the networks calls the race for Dave Worley. Uh, and then I think another network called the race for Dave Worley. Uh, I'm up in the suite with Newt, you know, it, who is, you know, wanting to know, you know, you keep telling me we're going to win this thing. I'm watching the TV here. There seem to be some pretty smart folks who don't agree with you. Um, and that's how the night's going. So the moment they call the races, I then call around to all of my county, all of my county people and to find out when they lock the ballot boxes down because I know they can't stuff the ballot boxes once the ballot boxes are locked down. Uh, so we've got people in every, I remember Alec Point of it went to Fulton for me and he, uh, uh, and made sure the ballot boxes were locked down. But I knew there was one county, Fayette County, which had its ballot boxes open. And I knew there was one precinct, the California precinct, that we were going to win by probably a thousand votes. So I let them lock down every ballot box in the district thinking they've won by 400 or I forget how many votes uh, CBS said. And the moment the last ballot box other than the California precinct ballot box got locked down, once it was locked down, I then uh, said to my county guy, we're good for, for California to be to be." Lockdown. So they then released California 
precinct, we win by like we, a thousand votes, which makes up the entire margin, and then Newt wins by, you know, six, seven hundred votes. Uh, that, was, that was all building in the idea that that corruption level had reached such voter, voter and ballot integrity was so bad that we had to do something about it. So when I got on the election board, the first thing I did was we started investigating um, and hammering whenever there were violations. And you, could, you can't believe the violations we would see. There literally, I remember one where in Chatham County, uh, after the polls have closed, they've already counted everything, they discover a box of ballot boxes <laughs> in the trunk of somebody's car. Or there was a box of ballots, absentee ballots in the floorboard of somebody's car. Uh, or the sheriff, who was a, was a Democratic incumbent, was responsible for transporting. Um, or the votes from a precinct got lost. And so I knew we were there, but these elections just, in, you know, were either getting stolen or lost. Was it an issue of, of, of malice, or was it a case in many times of just there were no standard protocols for, for like well, the uh, trunk of the car, the the... the floorboard of the car to load it up in Betty's van and she'll take it down to the courthouse kind of thing. Was, was it an issue of there need to be standardized procedures for how ballots absentee and, and I think it's yeah, I think it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you have when you have <coughs> I forget how many voters it was a hundred voters voting in in uh, Dodge County in alphabetical order <laughs> I mean, literally, I mean, just think about that for a second. Somebody had to stand out in the line and say, okay, all the A's come up first. We want you to vote first. All the B's go. They're very structured yeah, down right. in South Georgia. Uh, well, it's middle Georgia. It's but, fair, yeah. fair, uh, fair. But, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is, I think you had a little bit of all of it. You know, some part of it was there were many places that thought the general election was just a joke, you know, you know, the, 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 the elections decided in the Democratic primary, why, why would we take any kind of precautions or protocols uh, in the general election, you know, because we already know the outcome. And, of course, I knew that that wasn't true from, from having been the 6th District Chair because the beauty, the beauty of being the 6th District Chair at that time was I got the blend. I had, I had Clayton County and Douglas County which were a lot like Cobb and uh, North DeKalb at the time. Mm -hmm. But I also had Heard County and Troop County and Coweta County. And then I had Polk County, which was nothing. I mean, and, and so I literally had a microcosm of the entire state. That's a good point. In my district. And so I had to, we had to create systems that would work in all areas of the, because we wanted to win every county. Uh, I mean, that, it, you know, for no, there was nothing, nothing acceptable about losing a county. It's why he debated in every single county. Um, so, that you know, to answer your question, the, the the truth is that it was a product of all of it. It was incompetence, it was sloppiness, it was lack of protocols, and in some cases, it was, you know, okay, yeah, we're we're ninety seven votes short, you know, and. Uh, you know, somehow, you know, some missing precinct came in or some missing ballots came in and it was 150. What role did you play? You know, we've talked about Sonny Perdue becoming governor in 2002. What did, what did that mean uh, for the party that it had finally kept? In, in Georgia, the governor's office is a powerful uh, position. Right. What did that mean for the party um, in terms of, of, of reaching from going from minority party status to governing majority? Well, I think it meant legitimacy. I meant more than anything. I mean, when you're out recruiting candidates, they want to know that you, in fact, have, you know, the horsepower to back them up. And there's no better horsepower than having the governor come to your district or the governor talk about putting a library or a new road in your district or recruiting a business to come to your district. And so, uh, and Sonny was a really good governor. That was the other thing that happened. Uh, they, 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 
they threw everything they could at him. I met filing complaints about the fact, you know, that, that they flew around on Mary, his wife's plane, because the plane ended up being titled in her name. I mean, it was just, it was just pet, pettiness. I mean, uh, but they gave it everything they had because they, candidly, Democrats thought that that election, the two, 2002 election, yep. was a fluke. That it was just an absolute fluke, and that you know, just give them four years, and in four years, either Kathy Cox or uh, Taylor, Mark Taylor, was going to was going to just come back and restore order to the state. And they didn't realize that it was just the crowning blow. I mean, it was the knockout punch. And I remember on the night that Sonny won, I remember saying in Sonny Sweet, we, we won't see another, um, we won't see another uh, Democrat win a vacancy at the statewide level for 20 years. Uh, you know, we're now at year uh, 16, 18, 16, 16 and about to hit 18. Now, well, you know, this year will be an interesting test because we've got some vacancies. Uh, Secretary of State and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Department of Insurance. We've got some vacancies, so it'll be an interesting test. But I knew it was going to be a long, it would be over a decade just because the governorship had just been that elusive mm -hmm. office that we just could never quite get our act together. I mean, uh, you know, but for... Zell Miller talking about a turtle laying on a post in the final <laughs> debate of Johnny Isaacson. Isaacson's the governor. I you know, I've forgotten about the turtle. But for, you know, Guy Milner at the end of the race, like Mitt Romney did in his race, taking his foot off the accelerator, we'd ha we would have had a Republican governor. And both times we were that close. But, but when Sonny beat you know, it, it wasn't a vacancy. I mean, it was an outright, you know, I'm taking on your biggest dog, Governor Roy Barnes, and 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 you win, and you win handily. I mean, that, you know, everybody wants to talk about, oh, that, that, was, that was the race about the flag. Well, candidly, at the end of the day, if you actually looked at the numbers and started studying them, the, it was a it was a realization by the average voter, Republican voter in Georgia, that they were in fact Republicans, um, and it just coalesced. Setting aside Washington, and we can talk about the national yeah. politics in a little bit. What defines the Republican Party of Georgia in terms of its priorities as a governing party? Well, I think fiscal responsibility. I think delivering on your promises. I think. You know, uh, Governor Deal has made Georgia the number one place in the United States, number one state to do business. Um, having a judiciary that that uh, lawyers and companies around the world respect, uh, because he's appointed so many judges, and but he's appointed judges that are really talented. Uh, he's really separated Georgia. I mean, bringing the movie industry here. I mean, anybody who thinks that this state is is remotely close to the state that that it existed when he took over is just delusional. I mean, this is a completely different place. Uh, he didn't, you know, to his credit, um, he 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 did what only a Republican could do with criminal justice reform. I mean, my wife was on that on the uh, initial criminal justice reform group. Uh, only, a, only a Republican could say putting everybody in jail isn't the answer. A Democrat could never do that because they'd be accused of being too lenient. It took a Republican to be able to do that, and he had the courage to do it. Only, only a Republican could take on, you know, uh, systemic governmental infrastructure reform, changing the way agencies operate to make them more accountable, to bring in really talented people, and then to open the door to new industries like the movie industry, I mean, he he he's he's been he's changed it. I would have to say the last time I've seen a governor make such a difference would have been Zell Miller and the Hope Scholarship. Um, the number of 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 
professionals today, the number of people today, the number of workers today, the number of citizens today who have a college degree because Zill Miller wanted them to stay here rather than to go to some other state to get their degree by creating the Hope Scholarship, we will never be able to measure that. And so what, what, what Nathan Deal was able to do is take the, take the cleanup that Sonny Perdue brought in, which was to enough of this cronyism, enough of this, all, you know, these the systems and structures that don't work, let's bring the state into the 20th century. Uh, he took and put one foot on the Hope Scholarship Program from Zell Miller and the other foot on the platform that Sonny Perdue built of creating a state that's actually credible and then he took it to a whole new level. But I don't think he could have done it had you not had, had you not had a Sonny Perdue or you not had a, a Zell Miller um, doing what he did with the Hope Scholarship. Are there issues that, that Republicans and Democrats, and we're in, we're in an age of you know, historic partisanship, but are there issues that, that Georgia Democrats and Georgia Republicans either have been able to cooperate on or, or should be able to cooperate on I think they uh, now have, and in the future. I think they largely have in, in Georgia. I mean, I think uh, Governor Deal has been an open-door policy and has worked really hard with Georgia Democrats in the legislature. When you look at the vote totals on the budget or on bills, I mean, I, we just haven't had, you know, any of those ripping, inner, you know, issues that just tear us, you know, to our very core. And a large part of that is he's been he's been the adult in the room. I mean, he really has. I mean, he's and he's willing to take the hits. I mean, he did it on the religious liberty bill. Uh, you know, uh, you know he he's done it. You know, time and time again behind closed doors, where he just you know I mean he's you know he's looking out what for the totality. He took seriously that that he was the governor of all of Georgia, and that's what he intended to be. Well, and the relationship that he built with with Kasim Reed, you know, who basically the their, their tenures span right. almost the, the same time. How much? How important has that been that a Republican governor was able to work so closely with the mayor of the city of Atlanta? Well, I think it was uh, well, it was critically important, but I think it was built on trust. My, you know, both of them are clients. Both of them are people that I know and respect. They have diametrically different uh, you know views on on controversial many controversial issues but the fact of the matter is is that the most important commodity for getting work getting things done in government is is the trust factor uh, we don't have it in Washington DC neither side trusts the other side uh, that's why you you see the president constantly having these, televised forum so that every American can see exactly where everybody stands and then it becomes harder to back away. But with uh, Kasim and, and Nathan and even Stacey Abrams when she was the minority leader, there was, this, there was this genuine appreciation we don't agree on these things, but we can agree on these things. So there is no excuse for us not to do these things, and that's what happened. So we're, we were approaching, um, I think we said 15, 16, 17 years of Republican mm -hmm. governance here in Georgia. What is the, the greatest danger to the Republican majority in the state or, or for, for the Democrats to find a way back to becoming a competitive, a consistently competitive party? Well, if you, being, being a, somebody who studies politics, a political scientist of sorts who lived it, you know, I mean, uh, party control typically runs a life tenure of about two decades. And it has, a, you know, there are great articles written on the, on the, uh, the life cycle of a party, which is, it, you know, it starts out uh, and it's party driven. And then it turns to being candidate driven, which starves the party of resources because all the money goes to reelecting the candidates none of the money goes back to the party. And then eventually uh, there's then not enough sheer party energy and resources to sustain the candidates and they can't do it on their own. 
and then you end up with a switch. And so if you looked, if you looked at any other state in the country, take Tennessee, you know, which went through the cycle of being totally Republican, and then they went back Democrat, now they're back Republican. It's a life cycle. And part of that life cycle is, is uh, really involves, you know, when you're in the majority, pretty soon you start focusing on just staying in the majority. And when that happens, then you start to lose touch with what people really care about because you're most interested in, you know, what do I need to do to make sure that I, I, I keep this job next year? And we've seen that in the Congress. I mean, uh, you know, the 94 revolution was then followed by Nancy Pelosi taking over from Speaker Hastert, you know, in a huge swing. And then it was another huge swing in a very short life span back to John Boehner and a huge Republican majority uh, we've yet to see, you know, how successful Paul Ryan will be on a midterm, uh, but we'll find that out this, you know, coming up this November. So there are life cycles, but in each time, it's been, it's been the the ability of the minority party to feed on all of the things that the majority party ignored because they were so focused on getting reelected. Where do you come down on, on demographic change? Uh, the Democratic Party here in Georgia and elsewhere is, is counting on demographic change in, in places like Gwinnett County, uh, Cobb County, mm -hmm. to, to really fuel uh, uh, a, a democratic resurgence. Where do you come down on, on the whole demographics as, as political destiny? Well, I would have said before Donald Trump, you know, <laughs> uh, that's probably, you know, you know, Democrat, you know, the, I thought President Obama had done a very effective job of dividing the country along demographic lines and pitting, you know, different demographic groups against each other, but just making sure that the membership of his groups tallied more than 50%. Donald Trump comes along and, uh, you know, a great example is African-American voters. Now, everybody thought, you know, this guy isn't going to get any African-American voter. Well, it turns out he got, what, double what Romney got in the prior cycle because he came out and he said, how much worse can you do? I mean, you've had a, you've had a, a Democrat African-American president for eight years. And look at your unemployment. Look at your poverty level. Look at your uh, illiteracy rate. Look at your, you know, college graduate rate. Um and now Trump's been in office a year, a little more, and you have the lowest unemployment rate among African Americans in the country. And now, do I think that you're going to have a ground surge of African American support? Certainly not publicly. But what we found out in the last presidential election, which we've discovered in many other elections, is when when this political correctness starts to peek its head out it distorts polling enormously. So nobody in Pennsylvania wanted to tell you they were going to vote for Donald Trump because it was just taboo to be for Donald Trump in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or Ohio or Michigan. It just it wasn't going to happen. So all the polling is rolling in. It's not going to be. It's going to be a cakewalk. You know, uh, the Democratic nominee orders fireworks. We're sitting here looking at the, you know, at the uh, uh, the data that we're getting in from political footprints. This, these are the five things this voter cares about, and now they're going to go vote. And none of them are Donald Trump. None of them. Are. They they care about. They think the system is broken, or the swamp needs to be drained or they don't want another politician. And even though we know that if a pollster called that voter and asked, are you going to vote for Donald Trump, the polls, that voter would say no. We know, given what they're telling us, they're going to vote for Donald Trump. I mean, they, they've just, they, they've, same way with, you know, uh, any number of groups. And so before that phenomena, I would have said, yeah, I said, you know, pretty solidly demographic footprints are now the, you know, are the, is the tool of choice the same way, you know, the tool of choice in the 80s was uh, cultural issues. 
you know, everything from abortion to everything else down the road. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, you had you, you know, so you had one set of issues, you know, in the '80s and '90s. You got another set in the 2000, 2010, you know, 2000, you know, 60. Uh, election, and then suddenly you have the transform this transformation that I talked about, where where they cared about whole different issues. So I don't know that I I don't know that demographics certainly are a factor to take into account. It's certainly not one that I think is now dispositive anymore. What do you think the you talk about the transformation of the party, a realignment around a, a different of right, the electorate, right, the whole electorate, right. yeah. Well, how about how about the, the transformation of the Republican Party in terms of priorities? We look back at, at George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, Ronald Reagan in terms of free trade, uh, uh, deficit def control, right? Mm, exactly. Um, yeah. Maybe an open-handed immigration policy, right. yeah. um, especially global defense right. engagement. To to Donald Trump, which. It, Correct me if I'm wrong. There, there's not a, a readily identifiable ideological thread. Well, um, I think there is for Trump. It's just a different one than that has been the cornerstone of the party for many years. I right. Mean, okay. The deficit was a cornerstone. Everybody talked about the deficit that ran as a Republican. Donald Trump came in and he said, now let me get this straight. Every business that starts successful builds and grows starts out by taking out a loan. Every family that starts out and they buy a new home, they take out a loan because they believe in the future. They believe that over time they'll make more and more money, in which case the mortgage payment will be a less and less part of what they're doing. Um, I don't think that's going to be, I don't think at the end of the day that's going to be the issue. And so, and, you know, I meant, uh, you know, it's where, where he's, you know, in touch with, you know, more people. I mean, I, I personally continue to believe the deficit is an enormous issue, but I also recognize that if you grow the economy fast enough, the deficit's a less and less issue. Same way with free trade. Newt was speaker when NAFTA was passed. I was there. And now we're saying, oh, NAFTA, it's the worst thing in the world. You know, why in the world would we treat Mexico and Canada the same? They have nothing in common as far as being a trading partner. We should have a bilateral or a negotiated multilateral, which is really two bilaterals, which is, okay, we'll have one trade agreement with Canada, who's a lot like us, and we'll have another trade agreement with Mexico, uh, which is not a lot like us. Uh, but we want them to be a lot more like us. Well, those are that's what I referred to as being a transformative moment, which is... So you have a party which has these cornerstones, which are suddenly now not the cornerstones anymore. So I don't, I don't and, and, and what's happened is it's left currently, we'll have to see, currently the Democratic Party with an identity crisis because they can't say, oh, you know, the Republicans want to cut spending and hurt the poor because they're so preoccupied with the deficit. Well, the 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 the, uh, the the CR is now gone, and then effectively, and the you know the gov the, the president has signed a bill authorizing spending for two years to fund what both sides wanted. So, if you're a Democrat, where do you go? If 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 your answer is, oh, the Republicans are so pro Second Amendment, they won't consider. Anything they won't even consider increasing the age from 18 to 21 to get a gun, and the president comes out and says, "Okay, I think uh, we need to look at increasing the age. We need to have better background checks, checking for the mentally ill. We need to eliminate bump stocks. We need to do all of these things." And you're a Democrat. What do you say? Well, ju just yesterday, telling members of his own party that that they were afraid of the NRA. That's right. So, you, so what's le what's what's happening? Which, listen, it'll, it'll be an interesting gamble, and I, I I'm not going to bet against the president because Lord knows he's proven that the uh, to be just have an instinct for knowing where things are. Is he's he's setting the 18 election up to be a pure referendum on him, uh, and he's betting that the average American will say. 
My, my pay has gone up. My taxes have gone down. The job market is better. The country is safer. And the world respects us. Eh, I think we'll let them. I, I think we'll stick with the Republicans. Do you think that that priority set that, that, that you talked about is going to, to, to trickle down or, or sort of affect politics at a state level? Would you know, Georgia Republicans under the gold dome over 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 yonder um, that although although that we can't run deficit. Well, we yeah. can. But um, do you think that's going to transform politics beyond uh, Donald Trump? Yeah, only and, only to the extent that you'll now have people say you know, that I'm, I'm a supporter of Donald Trump. And if you want to make this a referendum on Donald Trump, then I'm with Trump. And t there's not going to be a Democrat who say, I'm with Donald Trump. So his coattail effect, um, if, if he proves to be right, will be enormous and will change, not just, not solidify Georgia's red, will probably, you know, and remember, as you know, this is a huge year because it's it's the reapportionment year, uh, where the legislature will re redraw the line, or during the tenure of this governor, the next governor will redraw the lines. And so it's a it's a really important year, and you know there's going to be a lot riding on you know uh, on on a new line of demarcation. The line of demarcation will will not be deficits. You know, Second Amendment. I mean, it'll be it'll be those issues, but it'll be those issues to the extent that Donald Trump defines them. Uh, and I think he I think he perfectly well knows what he's doing, and I think he's willing to take that take that risk. He was willing to take the risk of saying, Ray, being the only person on the stage to raise his hand to say, I don't know if I'll support the nominee. Now that's the kind of guy who's who's willing to take on the entire system. The the special elections here in Georgia, John Ossoff, unknown right. Democrat, gets forty eight percent of the vote in, in Speaker Gingrich's old district, the sixth right. district in, in North Metro. Uh, Jen Jordan over in Buckhead yeah. win, wins Hunter Hill's old seat. Suburban Athens, North Oconee County goes Democratic. Do those special elections give a political professional like you? Paul, how much do they tell us about 2018? Uh, not a lot. I mean, I, I, th I thought the I thought the uh, sixth congressional district, you know, was what I what what I think it is the Democrats fear for 2018, which is you you were you know you were killed by an abundance, which is we had so many good candidates run that you it was necessarily that the Democrat, I mean, remember, I mean, Trump won that seat by the same, about the same percentage level that Karen Handel ended up winning the seat. Maybe, maybe she did, I think she did a little bit better, maybe by a point or two. Uh, so the percentage really didn't change much. What's changed was the, num the, the number of denominators or whatever the numerators to divide it by. I, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to but but basically you divided it among more people the same number by more people uh and i think that's that was uh, uh you know on the state senate seats listen uh those were two seats uh that we were we were fortunate to have candidly uh and were ecstatic that we were able to marshal the resources using governor deal to uh to win them um i think we appointed the state senator from Athens to the Superior Court. Uh, uh, Regina Quick to the court, and, yeah. and, and, and uh, Chuck Williams, I think, heads the forestry. Right, um, and so both of them were, the, listen, we were well aware, I mean, you know, being the co-chair of the Judicial Nominating Commission, I was well aware of the risk of taking an incumbent Republican out, uh, and aware of the risk. On the other hand, she, you know, she was a superior candidate, and I think is a great, by all accounts I hear, is a great judge. So, but it is the deal model, which is I want really talented people, you know, working in state government. How much do you think, you know, look, looking at the Ossoff race, the fact that I believe it's the most expensive congressional race in history? I don't know, Daryl. I just, 
They spent well, a lot of money fair. in his seat in, in San Diego. So I, He's got I, a lot of money to spend. That's right. So uh, I, I don't know if it's the money. It may be. Uh, I know that it was, <coughs> I, I think it was the, it was the lash back by the Democrats, which yeah. was, uh, which was, a mis- in my personal opinion, a huge mistake on their part to spend that kind of resources given how limited their resources are. I mean, the, the RNC fundraising is just off the scale. The NRCC, I mean, the, the fundraising on the Republican side is just coming out of the woodwork. Part of it is because more Repub- Republicans have more money to give that the economy is doing sufficiently well, their 401ks are doing sufficiently well, their wages are going up. They have more money to now donate. So, but I also know from the Roy Barnes, Sonny Perdue race, and even the Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton race, that money doesn't win elections. I mean, I, yeah, it's a great indicator, uh, but Nathan Deal wasn't the biggest fundraiser when he won in a crowded primary with John Oxendine and you know, but it just, it, it, yeah, it's good to have, and you never want to complain about having it. On the other hand, uh, having, having started my career with the very idea that I'm in a congressional district where you have no money, you have people willing to put up yard signs, you have people willing to phone their friends, there, you have people willing to send a postcard to everybody in their church directory. Uh, that was, that, you know, and, they didn't have money, but they had that. You know, they had enough for the stamps to go on the postcard. Zooming out a bit, Donald Trump, an unconventional anti-establishment uh, figure, um, United Kingdom with Brexit and Jeremy Corbyn, who, mm-hmm. who com- diametrically opposed politically to Donald Trump, but still a very anti-establishment figure. Uh, France with the the rise of the National Front and Marine Le Pen, is is it some is there something broader going on in terms of transforming the the the, the small L liberal political system that has held sway in the West for so long, or or, or are we reading too much into a couple of election cycles? Personally, I think we're all reading too much into the cycles, and I'm one of them. I mean, I I, I you know. You know, it's kind of like uh, you know what news channel you watch. You watch what you want, what you what you. They tell you what you want to hear, and uh, so yes, I, I'd, I'd like to think, you know, that when I look at the elections across Europe, especially, that we've got a kind of a growth of this idea of populism. Um, but but I have to be realistic about you know who are you know the the realities of the differences in, in the way the various systems work. You know, if I saw seven countries all of a sudden, like, you know, I, you know, I, there, there are countries that have elections this year. Mm. And all indications are that the conservative parties in most of those elections are going to do quite well. Like it, Italy's on Sunday. It, that's right. Uh, so, I, 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 you know, those are certainly objective criteria, whether or not they reflect the kind of pattern that we'd like to see. Or, or whether we should be fearful of, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just, you know, you have to, you have to, uh, I, I don't know, it's probably one, one you probably Peter principled me. You think of me <laughs> one grade above. <laughs> I, we need Newt in here to talk about world politics. Right, right. He, the education system right. of the Belgian Congo. That's right. Uh, you know, you talked about the life cycle of the parties. Um, you know, projecting out. If, if you, you know, putting you on the spot. Right. What does Georgia politics look like 10, 20 years from now? You know, we, we, we talked about, I think we were off camera, we were talking about yeah. George Busby and Joe Frank Harrison. There's not a whole lot of daylight politically between between those two Democrats and, and a Sonny Perdue and a Nathan Deal. Well, what do you think? From, the from much holds? success often comes failure. Uh, and from failure, much failure often comes success. I. I don't know which side of the coin if you look 20 years out because with the changes in technology, we just don't know. I mean, you know, we now have a we now have a device in our hand that can manage everything from our calendar to our Uber pickup to our laundry to our groceries being Locks delivered. Locks on your front door. Yeah, that's right. 20 years from now, how, how does that translate? I can't even think of it. You know, I, I said to somebody the other day, uh, one of the newscasts the other day, I said, 
they were asking me, you know, what do you, what do you think the year, you know, 2024 when Trump's second term is up is going to be like? And I go, I can't, I can't even see past, I can't even see to 2020 given how transformative this electorate currently is. It's, it's in a state of change. Um, to go back to where we started this interview, my grandparents didn't believe that we actually landed on the moon. We had one light bulb. One. And it was in the dining room. When I was really young, they didn't have indoor plumbing. We had outhouses. To compare that generation to this generation would be ridiculous. Because this generation knows nothing but the benefits of the technological advances so that the issues that are important to us have changed. For them, they lived through the Depression. And as a result, making sure you had food on the table, that you had a steady job, there were people to buy your crops, those were the issues of the day. The issues of today range from climate change to you know, the currency exchange rate to whether or not we should have an import-export bank, to, you know, everything in between. And the issues of tomorrow will be issues that we can't think of today. I can guarantee you that, that my grandparents, who, who did everything they could to make sure that all of us had a chance, never thought about climate change. So I don't know how I can think about what, you know, my great-grandchildren or grandchildren are going to be thinking about whenever they go to the polls when they turn 18. Well, Mr. Evans, thank you very much for taking time out of your, your, your busy schedule thank you. um, to participate in the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Go dogs. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.